Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Keith Andrew Network. This is episode 256. I'm here with Jeffrey Hardy. And I just want to say thank you for accepting my request. Mm -hmm. Sure, you're welcome. It's a pleasure to meet you. Now, for people who want to know what the Keith Andrew Network is, basically the whole point of my talk show is to show people that even with having a learning disability, I can still overcome controversy and reach my goals in life. At the same time, I'm able to turn myself into a perfect example for people out there dealing with any types of learning disabilities and disabilities. But you should never give up and you should prove to people you can stem out to something. But labels do not dictate who you are and who you're going to be. So that being said, half hour of your time and starting off, what can you tell us about yourself? Okay, well I live in New York and as you can probably tell, I talk funny. I'm not from New York. I'm uh, I'm a bit of a hybrid. I'm f originally from Australia. I lived there for the first 20 years of my life. Then I moved to California briefly uh, for a couple of years. I was an actor for a Shakespearean company there. And then I went to London and I lived there for 14 years. So that was from 1977 through to 1991. Uh, interesting time. It was during the regime of, well, the tail end of a, a certain uh, bleak period, I suppose, in British history, and then uh, it got even bleaker when Margaret Thatcher came into power, so I was there during Margaret Thatcher's reign. And then I went back to Australia for 14 years, and in 2000, and I've, and I've always had a love affair with New York. I've been a frequent visitor to New York throughout that whole period, and always hoped that one day I might be able to spend more time, or perhaps even in a fantasy world, live, live here. And, uh, but that seemed a bit unattainable. And uh, then in 2003, um, I was married, um, and I was going through sort of a, a divorce, a sticky divorce, there aren't too many good divorces. And almost on the eve of my divorce, I was informed that I'd won a green card in the green card lottery. So it was almost like being tapped on the shoulder that there was an opportunity for me to start a new life to a certain extent, I suppose, while keeping my roots alive. But it was it seemed so indifferent that there was an opportunity to come and live in New York. Um, start again, I suppose, in some ways, as we, we all can do when we come from big countries. Uh, so I moved here. Moved here full time. I was again a frequent visitor up until 2007, and I moved here full time in 2007. So I'm shortly coming up to my 10 year uh, anniversary of being uh, a New Yorker. Although I, I don't know if I can call myself a New Yorker, it's up to others to call call me that. Although I must say, when I lived in London, which was 14 years, nobody would ever say if you were not from London would ever say you're a Londoner. Uh, but within two weeks of being living in New York, and I had a compass because it's important on this island to know which is north, south, east, west. Uh, within two weeks of it, uh, I was able to show a tourist who asked me directions. They want to know where East 3rd and 56 or something like that was. And uh, I was able to give them directions. Somebody I was with who was a New Yorker said, you're a New Yorker now, you can, you, you know the points of the compass and you can give people directions. So that was a very, for me, quite a significant thing that somebody, uh, this city where I now live, was generous, is generous enough to be able to call people who choose to live here. New Yorkers, there's no, no, and I suppose it's a bit relevant in some ways to, to what you're talking about, inclusiveness. Uh, and I think if you're if you're a New Yorker, we all have the same the same excitements, the same frustrations, same annoyances of the place. And just in terms of living here, I love living here. When I lived in London, I used to have a I hate London day probably once a week, maybe even more than that. I love London, but but in truth, it, it's a frustrating city in many ways because it's big, it's crowded, the streets are narrow. Public transport's kind of okay. A lot of frustrations with living in big cities are to do with public transport, aren't they? Um, but uh, I have a 
I hate New York Day maybe, maybe once a month, but probably more likely once every three months. And then usually to do with me, not to do with, <laughs> with New York, because you accept you accept a lot of people, you accept crowded subways, you accept a lot of people. Um, sightseeing, looking up at the buildings as you're walking down the sidewalk, um, and then the minor frustrations for the, the pleasures of, of living here, the excitement, the electricity of, of living in this big city. And I don't want to be a, uh, um, you might want to ask, but I, so just to fill in a couple of the gaps there, my profession is I, I wear a few hats, as a lot of people do in New York. I'm an actor. Um, and I also teach. Uh, I teach Shakespeare, I teach acting, I te teach film studies, not filmmaking, film studies. And I uh, am also an attorney, a lawyer. Uh, so I, that sort of, it used to be the other way around that I was um, uh, an actor who in between acting jobs was an attorney. These days, at the moment anyway, I'm an attorney in, in between attorney jobs, I do some, some acting. So it's been a, a bit of a switch in that way. So I wear those three hats, look silly in the mall probably, uh, but that's, that's what I do and that's what you have to do in New York to, uh, you know, you either have to have a, a fairly good steady income or, or multitask and uh, that's what I do, I guess I multitask. All those, all those things, one of which is the law is left brain, I guess, in terms of that kind of methodical approach uh, you need, and the uh, creative stuff, the acting and the teaching is probably right brain. Uh, so there's a bit of a, a bit of a struggle between those two sometimes, but that's so that's what I do. What I do here. Hmm. No, absolutely. Now, what can you tell us about being a warrior? What type of work do you do? Uh, well, I the reason I uh, took up law was having been in the uh, entertainment industry as a performer and also as a producer putting some things together I wanted to work in entertainment law um, which is a glamorous title basically for contract law um, so I do a bit of that not as much of that as I would wish I'm primarily involved in, in litigation here and what's called the discovery stage of litigation which is where evidence is gathered um, I'm certainly not at the sharp end of of uh, litigation, I'm more the more at the uh, at the workman end of, uh, of helping to compile evidence and I identifying um, you know things that may be helpful or harmful to whoever the clients may be. And the clients, for the most part, are, are large corporate clients. So it's as I say, it's more on the the big business side rather than entertainment law, which is much preferable to me, but there we go. I've also, have, coming from Australia, I had a specialist area of maritime law, transport law, so uh, I have two great loves of theatre and I love the sea, the ocean, and it encompassed, encompassed that particular passion I have for the ocean, and uh, I can't say I'm hugely enamoured with ships, but I like things to do with the ocean. No, absolutely, that's one of the class if you can stay centred, Mm -hmm. Because when I do the uh, editing, you get it and it's got to cut everything off the side. Okay, so, so I'll, there we go, center. Yep, perfect. All right. Mm -hmm. Now the next question I was going to ask you is, what's your opinion on uh, people re trying to rebuild a Titanic? Uh, to, to, well, there are a lot of superstitions, and I suppose one has to respect the superstitions. Um, and then sailors, I suppose, traditionally, because they were so subject to the elements and, in a way, good fortune, um, uh, I respect their superstitions. And, you know, ghosts perhaps should not be brought up. But it's kind of irre irresistible, isn't it, that the Titanic is such a, uh, such a uh, engaging story, um, uh, iconic story for us all. I used to live on the Upper West Side, um, at around about 105th in New York. And right near there, there is a, a beautiful small park on Broadway, which was put together by one of the families who lost several people on the Titanic. 
And uh, so I was reminded of the Titanic nearly every day when I went walk through that small park. Uh, as I say, it's irresistible. I'd, I'd certainly like to know a little bit more, although we kind of know what went wrong. Uh, it hit an iceberg. Uh, it's not one of those mysterious what caused the thing to sink. We, we do know. Um, and I suppose the fact that there are a lot of very privileged people on board um, that there would be some fascinating artifacts of the time, archaeological dig equivalent kind of artifacts. So it's intriguing. Um, I can't say I think it necessarily should happen. I think it probably should be put to the families, uh, although they're two or three generations on from when it happened, maybe four generations. Uh, so I suppose for many of them, there's not that personal. There may be, some people might have religious beliefs that might exclude uh, uh, exhuming it, as it were. Uh, so I, I, I guess they should have a say. And it's it's interesting thing about it, and comes from my legal knowledge, I think it's, it's beneath the high seas. So it's in an area where no one really has any jurisdiction, as far as I know. I know it's off New York, but it's quite a way beyond the uh, territorial sea of New York. Uh, so, in a way, nobody owns it. And whoever, under the law of maritime law, law of salvage, whoever pulls it up would be able to claim ownership of what they pull up under... Well, I suppose it's not. they're not really salvaging the ship, they're not saving the ship. But that's it's an interesting legal issue as to who would own those things that if they can ascertain what family certain artifacts belong to. Do they belong to the family? Are they the property of the finder? Who otherwise, if the finder were not there, they would not have been found. So it's an interesting, interesting little uh, legal exam question, <laughs> which to which I don't think there's any definitive answer. Uh, but it's an interesting one. But it's a good question. Well, yeah. the two other things I want to talk to you about is one: Do you think people should just dig up the artifacts and put them in a the museum? Number one, and why doesn't anyone talk about the poor animals that die on that day? Well, that's, that's interesting. Just ask me the first question again. Oh, what was these things people said dig them up, dig up the artifacts, or do you see if everything doesn't leave them alone? Oh, I see. Uh, well, as I say, I, I think it's possibly a, a, a question of superstition if they should be disturbed. Uh, I guess it's no different from Egyptologists going and digging up Tutankhamun's um, objects or whoever, or even in London this very day, they're digging up, um, uh, uh, unearthing uh, parts of the Roman civilization when they were there. Um, it's interesting if it, it certainly can inform us about uh, life in those days, and I'm sure there'll be some interesting things. So I don't have a strong view either way, but I think it has to be done respectfully, that's all. And in terms of the animals on board, well, uh, yeah, awful. Uh, one can't. I've never thought of it, to be honest. Um, but uh, now that you mention it, it would have, of course, be a horrible, horrible alien uh, death for them. Uh, yeah, horses, I presume, and and probably cows. I don't know. I really don't know too much about that. But that's an interesting, interesting question you raise. Yeah, but they would have provided good food <laughs> for the sea creatures. Uh, that's 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 for sure. That's true, and I also interviewed my friend, and she brought up a good point. Yeah, there were no black people on Titanic. Do you think Titanic was racist? Oh, good heavens! Uh, there were no were no no black people on on board. I don't well, know. Well, she she wrote uh, her own book of that. I think it was her grandparents or her great great grandparents were the first African Americans to be on Titanic, and that's her own book. Uh -huh. okay. But during the movie, they, there's no Asian people, there's no black people, so it's kind of like a bunch of rich, snobby white people. Do you think it's kind of... Well, it's probably, that's probably pretty accurate. I mean, I suppose the film 
which I didn't like very much, but the film had an obligation, I suppose, to be reasonably accurate, uh, and it probably would have been more offensive if they'd misrepresented the truth and had put um, you know, people of colour on uh, in the movie. Um, do I think that, I don't think the ship would be racist, because I don't think that the Titanic is capable of being racist, but I think it probably reflects what was going on in society in those days, that, that people of colour or uh, the different non-Caucasian um, backgrounds found that social mobility found it very hard to rise up through ranks, social ranks and ranks of wealth and earnings. So without a doubt, the society of then was more racially um, less um, accepting, less integrated than it is now. Still a long way to go even now on that sort of thing. But certainly, yeah, I think it, it probably is in many ways uh, an effigy of, of uh, privilege and uh, non-diversity, for, sh for sure, yeah. Do you know the, the more I look at you, the kind of the more you remind me of that guy from uh, Royal Pains. Are you... From, uh, from which? Or, uh, USA Royal Pains? Oh, I don't know. Um, no, I'm not him, but I don't know. You can be a stunt double. <laughs> right. <laughs> I might need it. No, I, I don't know him. But, uh, no. <laughs> that's go. saying, I just should put the two together. Yeah, but with that being said, were you any extras in any films? How did you get started in the acting? Who influenced you? All right. Well, uh, when I was at university in Australia, I was... I probably spent more time in the university theatre than I did in the law library. Uh, but I grew a, a love for performing um, and speaking stories through other characters as you do as an actor. And then when I finished my degree there, I was lucky enough to get a... I came to San Francisco and I auditioned for a theatre company and I was lucky enough to get offered several roles in Shakespearean plays, which uh, I was all of 20, 21 then, and lucky enough to tour right throughout the US in this theatre company. So I was, by time I was a young man, pretty uh, enamoured of the theatre, the performing arts. And then I went to drama school in London for uh, just over a year to London Academy of Music and Dramatic Art, and then I stayed on there. I was very lucky because I was, I kind of caught, a, caught the tail end of the great, what some people would refer to as the great days in British theatre, when a lot of the very substantial actors like Laurence Olivier and John Gilgood, Ralph Richardson, Michael Redgrave, um, movie stars, people who had a movie, Hollywood movie career as well, were alive. So I was lucky enough to be able to see a lot of them on the stage. Uh, so they certainly influenced me, and I guess probably my training being, and Australia being quasi-British background, my training being British, I guess my influences or influencers were in the British theatre, and also Hollywood movies influenced me a great deal too. Um, but I tend to like the classical canon of theatre, so Shakespeare, the, the costume plays, I like good literature. I like I like words. I enjoy words, um, and certainly there are many modern playwrights who are wonderful users of putting together together wonderful words. Uh, so my influences have been very extensive, and I've been lucky enough to be the protege of many people who have helped me along the way, as you do. And I think when you get some experience it's one of your obligations to help help younger people who are climbing the ladder and my time in the UK I worked quite a lot in plays in what was called repertory theatre I was there at the tail end of the repertory theatre system and I worked quite a lot of TV series BBC uh, series and I played featured parts and a couple of movies and I, so I didn't really do 
extra work. I've had small parts, many small parts, of course, but I've also been lucky enough to have some some substantial parts on TV and, and in film. Um, I did have a very small part to something you would probably have seen or your viewers may have seen called um, Money Never Sleeps, Wall Street 2. So I had a small right. part, part in that. Um, uh, and here in the US, I've done lots of theater, um, theater readings, um, a couple of films, and always looking out for work as we do as actors. We never, never know when the next acting job is going to come along. So, uh, as a, as I say, I've done lots, of, quite a lot of TV, uh, some film uh, recordings, uh, but a lot of theater. That's particularly what I, I like. I like the process that you need to go through with the theatre, which is a proper exploratory process of rehearsing for two, three, four weeks and getting to fully understand the context of the play and how your character fits in. It's a very different skill from film acting. It's all acting, of course, but film acting, you usually just turn up on the set and do it and go home. You don't have that two or three, four week rehearsal period. Uh, Of course, you're expected in film to have done that preparation yourself and then be guided briefly by by the director. But it's a very different different skill. And in truth, there just isn't enough time to explore with interaction with the other actors as there is in the theatre. No, absolutely. Now, wrapping up, you know, how can people follow you on social media? Are you on LinkedIn, Stage 32, Twitter, uh, Instagram? Yeah, Stage 32, I'm there. Um, I'm probably on Stage 31 and a half. I don't use it very much. Um, uh, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn. Uh, I can't, can't say I, I am, am hugely diligent in updating my my things, but I, I, don't, I don't tweet and I don't. Pinterest or um, uh, Instagram, I don't, I, I guess I should, but in truth, I, I, I go hot and cold on Facebook even, and particularly with all the political stuff going on at the moment, there's so much, so much of, of that one's inundated with it, and it's, it's some, so much of it is enraging, <laughs> people say things which surprise me, some, some of which I like, some of which I don't, uh, but uh, I'm on IMDb, the Net Movie Database. If I will show you my list of credits, and I can be contacted through there or or Facebook or LinkedIn. Yeah. <laughs> no, absolutely. Now we're wrapping up. It was a real honor and privilege to have you as a guest on my talk show. I just want to say thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for asking me. I've enjoyed it. Thank you.